Okay, so let's, uh, I don't want to go through the whole topic particular of this, but it just happens to be, it's a little bit on my mind. Last week's parasha, we spoke a little, well, we didn't, because we weren't together, but uh, the Jewish people, okay, discussed the death of the children of Aaron, right? Aaron's two children died, and uh, it was a pretty traumatic uh, situation. And we know that the Torah tells us, Bekrovei HaKadosh, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu brings those who are holy, brings uh, close to him. Okay, what exactly that means, et cetera, and also it's not always a comfort for some people to hear, but at the other times it is, it depends who a person is, et cetera, like where the background is and whatever. Okay, I just want to bring up something which is uh, very recent, current events, happened last night. A terrible thing happened last night, for those who are familiar, and for those who are unfamiliar, there were these two uh, people waiting by a bus stop about, it, it's, it doesn't really matter that it's like this, but it just makes it closer to home for me. It's about a, no, I can tell you, it's exactly, it's a 17-minute walk from my house, a one-minute drive, that uh, there's a bus stop on Kvish Echad, as they call it, even though it's more accurately known as Bar Lev, Kvish Shishim. And uh, there's a pestle there, they call it the pestle. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? It's like a big open grass area with, a, with like this type of circle and this triangle and a thing if you ever go towards Pisgat Zev or towards... Uh, even towards Tel Aviv. <clears throat> in any event, it's right near here. And last night, a fellow, an Arab driver, uh, drove his car into a bus stop, killing one person who passed away, I think, today, and a, a woman is injured, a 20-something-year-old girl is injured. So now the question is, how does one respond to certain ideas? So they say uh, it's uncertain if it, is a, if it is a terrorist attack, right? He lost control of his car at 80 miles an hour into a bus stop on the side, having no shaykhs to the road. Okay, in any event, you'll let me excuse my uh, feelings of cynicism, right, that this was an accident, but okay, I, I don't know if it is, I don't know if it isn't, but, but what I do know is, and this is, requires a lot of work, a lot of work, very challenging, life in general gets challenging when people go through uh, tsaras, they go through different painful experiences in their life, and how does one respond? How is one supposed to react to a situation when something not good happens, right? When bad things happen. And I'm not even getting into the discussion, although of course it's gonna touch upon it when bad things happen to good people, right? Because I don't, I, you know, excuse me for saying this, I don't know who it was that passed away, I'm sure he was a good person, I had maybe yes, maybe no, I, I don't know. Uh, but I just want to open up to everything. What's, what's the idea when bad things happen? What's going on over here? How does one deal with it? What's one's response supposed to be? So, first off, one has to recognize the fact, and this is before anything, in Judaism, we believe the fact that the Lord, praise be His name, hallelujah, is involved in every aspect of the world. There's no part of the world that Hashem's not involved with, which means if something's happening, that there's a reason why it's happening. There's, there are things that are going, nothing is random. Nothing is random. Okay, so they always have the question a person asks, so, so what does that mean if a person is abused as a child, they were supposed to be abused, like now they should be happy about it? I, I can't tell you the, the, the inner workings of Hashem. I have no idea. I, can't, I have no clue why Hashem does what He does. Hashem, right? Hashem answered by saying, you don't know me. Right? You don't, you don't, you're not God. You're, you're people, and you're living in a finite world. You're living in a world which you don't see everything, right? You don't see, not only see everything, you barely see anything, yeah? To borrow an example which I've used many times here, and if you're new, then you haven't heard it from me. If you're not, you've heard it from me. I uh, was sitting in my aunt's house in Maryland. This is in uh, Silver Spring, uh, Kemp Mill. And I was sitting against the wall at a, their table, and I turned around and I saw there was a painting behind me. But when I was, since I was very close to the painting, um, it just looked like a lot of, you know, splotchy paint. Because that's what it was, right? A lot of spots you paint. But as I moved further away, I remembered, I haven't been there in many years, but I remember the painting was a, like a dock with a water and a boat. Uh, nice, not gonna go off and say, like some people say, and it was a beautiful paint. I don't know, maybe it was, I guess it depends how you look at these things. But it was a painting, yeah, of a boat and water. But I remember when I was sitting over here, so it's very nice that it's painted, but I don't see anything, yeah? All I see is a bunch of, of a mess. As you move away from it, then you start to see, like, oh, maybe there's a bigger picture that I'm not seeing. What I can tell you is that we're living in a very small blip of history. 
Right, for those who, who believe in the, the Torah's uh, concept of the world being 5,775 years old, and you realize that how many years is a person living? Let's say you live maximum, I don't know, what's the record, 123 years or something like that, I don't know, whatever it is. That person lives 70, 80 years. You lived 120 years still, right? So what ends up happening? Out of 5,700 years? And for those who don't believe in the Torah's ca- accounting, but rather believe in the fact that the world's 14 billion years old, that makes it even better, right? Because now we know even less, yeah? Even within 5,000, the ratio is a lot closer. Sir, right, 14 billion, so we're totally missing the point what's going on. To recognize that I see something and to, to have the, uh, I guess the word is the arrogance to think that we have an understanding or, or that we should have an understanding of what's going on, I think that's, that's a lot lacking. There's a lot lacking over there. Come take a step back and realize you don't know what's going on. You have no clue what's going on. God created the world. God is, 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 is the ultimate good. God does everything for God. Everything the Lord does is good. So therefore, if we go, and now we see everything Hashem does is good, and now we go ahead and we see something, we're like, what's going on? This is bad. It's true. Our perception is it's bad. I got that. It's true. It's bad. But here's the point. You know, many of us have heard ideas like this. We've heard discussions about this, but how many of us have actually internalized the idea? And I'm including myself. I'm not saying that I'm above this. I'm saying how many of us have internalized it? It comes down to everything in our lives, everything that we're going through. A person who understands the fact that Hashem runs the world that God is involved in every aspect of the world, life is different, life is better, life is awesome, life is amazing. If you're someone who can recognize the fact that God runs the world, I don't get it, I don't understand why everything's happening, I, I don't get what's happening, but I do, I trust that Hashem knows what He's talking about. It all comes down to the idea of what we know is, is emuna. It, it, when we go and we can have emuna and bitachon, right? It's hard to translate these words in English, right? Faith, belief, trust, I don't know which one you want to use, but let's talk about trust for a second. If you trust someone, if you trust someone, so then you understand that even though you might not understand what they're doing, you're still okay with what they're doing. Does, does that make sense what I said? If you trust someone, so then even if you might not understand what they're doing, you're okay and you can handle certain things. I'll give an example of what I'm talking about. There's a, a story in the Parsha that talks about a very interesting Pasha, and I'm not going to give you Pasha Pshat, I'm not going to give you the simple explanation, I'm going to uh, give you another idea, Jirash, on this idea my brother shared with me a couple of years ago, that, I want to get the names right here, Avraham and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah, you heard of them before, being in Rochester, is that right? right so Avraham and Sarah were, were brother and sister, is that right? No, they were married. I just wanted to see how your education went. Anyway, so Avram and Sarah were married. And Avram and Sarah didn't have any children. They didn't have any children. So what did Sarah do? Davin. What? Davin. That's true, they davened. Yeah, and after that? Davin. No. Made Avram marry Hagar. Gave Hagar, very good. Hagar took a marry. Avram, right, and said, I'll be built up through, through that. I'll be built up through that. Okay, great. <laughs> this is what happens. He goes ahead, and he marries Hagar. Now, what happens when they get married? Now, this is after being married a number of years without any children. Hagar, the maidservant, gets married. And who is Hagar? Who is she? What's her background? Right, she was, she was the daughter of, of, of the king of Egypt, right? You're talking about daughter of Pyro. But what did he say when, he saw, when, when Pyro saw Avram? He's like... Whoa, this guy is holy. It's better you be a maidservant in the household of this guy, Avram, than even be the queen of another place. Like, this, is, this guy's huge. So he ends up, she ends up actually being able to marry him. And what happens? She gets pregnant. How quickly? Right away. She gets pregnant right away. Then the Pasuk says something very interesting. It says the Pasuk, Vatekel, Gevirta, Be'enea, and the now Sarah, who used to be this great woman in the eyes of Hagar, Vateka, she becomes light in her eyes. She becomes light in her eyes. Why? She's like, you're this great woman, Sarah, that everybody talks about as like the mother, the beginning, the founding mother of this, of this Judaism, this big thing, even though they have no children yet. Look at you. You were married for years. No children. I get married. Bam! Right away. I get pregnant. What you got now, girl? Vateka, give it to me now. And she now starts to look at her in a way which isn't so uh, positive. Then the Pasuk says something really strange. And Sarah, what does it say? What does she do? What's her reaction? That's one reaction. Anyone else? Kicks her out. No, they didn't kick her out this time. The later on, they get kicked out. 
But Sarah, what is the reaction? And she says the Pasuk Vatan now, and she starts to oppress her. She starts to oppress her, to have her feeling pain. And then the Pasuk says, Vatifrach, she ran away. Then Hagar ran away. She's like, I can't take this pain anymore. And she ran away. So the question that everybody who thinks asks, <laughs> we're talking about Sarah Imenu. Now, <laughs> Sarah Imenu, is, 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 this is big. We're talking about Sarah, who, who was the, the, the mother of everyone. She's acting in such a, like, what's going on here? How could she behave in such a fashion? So there are ways of explaining this not such a positive light. There are Rishonim that speak it out, which I, I would never say it if I didn't see it. I mean, you have to understand, everything depends on people's backgrounds. Uh, a lot of time we, we grow up, at least, I'll, I'll talk about me, I've, I got a bit of a mixed background in terms of that I grew up religious, but not, I wouldn't call it uh, by any means Haredi, as they, as they say, you know, right wing fanatic as I am today. So, so I grew up in a mentality of like a little bit cynical, a little bit cynical about the certain things that came up in the Torah. Like, did that really happen? And like, how could they behave in such a way? And like, David HaMelech and Batsheva, like what's going on? Like and all the different things that, that people who learn a little bit but not enough ask, right? And, and, and if you never, and never get the answers or if you don't get them early enough, what ends up happening a lot of times is that people grow up with this cynicism. And then, I don't know what the cutoff age is, but I would say probably once a person's already in their mid to late 20s and they haven't yet got a sufficient answer, then we start living in a certain way with that cynicism. And that even if at 40 and 50 and 60 and 70, we get answers that are real answers, we'll have a hard time hearing them because they've already decided that this is messed up. Does anybody get what I just said? A little, little psychology here, right? That what ends up happening is, that, and I see a lot of people come in this room like this. A lot of people come in this room who have questions, but their questions aren't questions anymore. They, they were once questions. Now they become answers. Uh, if anyone understands what that means, what that means is that a person who doesn't really want to live a religious lifestyle, for many reasons it could be, many times it's because of certain pain that they went through in their life, the childhood, whatever it is. But if a person went through certain pain, and what ends up happening is that they don't want to be involved with it, then they start using these questions as answers why it's okay for them not to be religious, right? See, the whole thing is ridiculous anyway, because look at, look at the way that, uh, look what Rufain did, and look what, uh, if you, I mean, you have to know a little bit what I'm talking about to understand these references, but I'm just, I'm not gonna go through each one of them, but look at Rufain, look at Sheva bin Yamin did, and look at, and look at, and look at the same David Amalek did, and look at whatever, oh, so, so clearly these people aren't such, I look at the Shaul, and look at, and look at all these people, can't be that they're really good, see? And you say, no, there's answers to that. Yeah, 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 whatever. Oh, sure, if you buy that answer, right? It's, it's like, yeah, I buy the answer because it's true, right? I had people that ask, you know, sometimes people go and they say, and I used to have this feeling, you know, like, what kind of answer is that? It's such a cop-out answer. Whatever the question is, right? And then there's an answer that comes up. Well, the reason is because X, Y, Z. Oh, what a cop-out. Now, let me ask you a question. If the answer I gave is true, is it a cop-out? If it's true, is it a cop-out? The answer is no, it's true, right? But if you don't believe it's true, so sure, now you're gonna call it a cop-out. Why wouldn't you believe it's true? Then we get into all emotional discussion, et cetera. But in any event, the point is that, that it's, it's, it's hard to understand, but let's go with the following, with this whole introduction. <clears throat> the Avos, the Imos, who were they? Who was Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov? Who were Sarah and Rachel? Who were Rivka, Leah? Who, who are these people? These are huge people, these are huge people. Understand when we say huge people, we mean that really we can't even begin to comprehend what they really were. Were they human beings? Yes, they were human beings. They were flesh and blood. If you were to cut them, they would bleed. If you throw them in a fire, they would... So in any event, the idea is, <laughs> I guess they would survive. Right? Like, I'm from Avina. But okay, but uh, no, if you throw them in a fire, they would burn. I mean, generally speaking, besides unless you're being threatening, if there's a god or multiple gods, right? So in which case, these are human beings. On the one hand, they were human. On the other hand... Who are these people? They were malachi ashar. They were like angels. We we're talking about huge. You know the pasuk says. I'm going to get back to it in a minute to this whole thing. Stay with me now. In Vayera, in the Brishas Noach uh, the fourth book of the Torah, I believe it's chapter uh, 18, Genesis. Is what happens? It says Vayera Yaakov um, Avram uh, Avram Avram goes and he sees these angels. He sees these three angels, right? And and he goes out to to greet them, and he and he feeds them food, and he whatever. Like, he just saw angels. Like, he's not, like, freaked out by that. He's like, these are angels, right? If you imagine you saw an angel. <laughs> you wake up, you look at your door, and you're like, like you'd be a little bit freaked out. Why was that not freaked out? The Ma'ara, the Gor'ari points out, you know why? What's that? 
Okay, so that's Rashi, right? Rashi points out he didn't know that they were angels. Why not? So the commentators explain because he was so used to seeing angels that it just like it was just like normal for him. That was like the norm. I've never even chilled with angels. And he said that's what he did. Right? Not hell's angels. I'm saying, but he, he, he chilled with, with angels. He liked the music, but he was into he was into angels. You understand? That's was norm. It was so normal for him to see the avos, imos. Who were they? The Gemara says so far. Anyone who says that the avos, that Avraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, anyone who says that they were like like malachim, like angels, then then we we are like bnei adam. We're like people. If they were angels, we are people. And if they're people, then we're hamorim. Then we're a bunch of donkeys. With Yaakov Kamenetsky says, interesting, he interprets the Gemara to mean anyone who looks at them like they were angels will call you a person. You look at them like people, you're a donkey. Right? Recognize who they were. These are great, great people. So with that in mind, because someone could just answer, look what, look what Sarah did. Well, it's normal human psychology is that a person would be upset and therefore they would lash out at somebody, right? It's not normal. And says, what are we talking about? The, the, the great, great people here. And by the way, there are some Yishonim that explains along those lines, but we still have to understand, Kechut HaSa'ari, we have to recognize the fact that we're dealing with over here very sensitive topics, and we have to learn from them. Okay, so in any event, back to the point, though, how do we answer up this issue that he went ahead and he, he oppressed her? So the way that my brother told it to me, and I believe he was quoting the son of Revel Yashiv, if I'm not mistaken, who came along and said the, the following uh, explanation. Has anyone here ever had a uh, situation in their life where they had to go to a doctor, some sort of physical therapist, or even a dentist uh, that had the procedure done that was painful? Anyone ever had that before? Yes? Yeah? yeah? Who? You, yeah? What was it? You, are you okay to share or it's uncomfortable? What's that? Was it painful? Was it painful? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Braces, what? Anyone else? What else? Wow, wow. What did you have, like vodka before? What did you do? And after? And during? Okay, yeah, it was painful. Okay, did you have a good dentist? What? Yeah, it's good. How do you know? Because he's like one of the top dentists in New York. How do you know that? I don't know. Right. <laughs> so now, so now listen to this. You're sitting on the chair. You're about to get your teeth pulled. Now, it was a painful experience, right? At least afterwards, when the stuff wore off, yeah, yeah. And if anyone went through physical therapy, it's a painful experience. If the braces ripped off, like they don't take it, they rip them off. Right? If you get rip them off, so it's a painful experience, right? But if you think about it, if you know you have the top doctor in New York, at least your mama said, if you get the top doctor in New York, so even though it's painful, you will walk in there yourself and sit in the chair and be willing to go through the painful experience. You see, if your mom hadn't reassured you that he was a good doctor, or of the or with people around you, of the community, whatever, hadn't reassured you, how quick would you be to sit down in the chair and have some guy rip your teeth out of your mouth? Probably right? You'd probably be like, imagine they said, uh, oh, you like my mouth? It's like, oh, we need to rip out your teeth. Oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's like, I have a canker sore. We have to cut it off. But right? cut it off. Like, what? Like, that is what we must do. Wait, what? Now, it could be, God forbid, low a person has certain things happening. They have to act, cancer or whatever. Things have to be done, but, but you got to really work that out, yeah? Now, as you're sitting on the chair, you're about to get the two, he's got a, a wrench holding on to one of them, right? He's got a drill in the other hand. He's ready to go, yeah? And as you're doing it, you, you know, you're reading the paper to, like, to you know, divert your attention, and you see on the front page, it says, Dr. So-and-so, the guy who's right next to you, DDS, is that what it's called? DDS, right? D D dentist, right? And he says that afterwards, in big letters and red letters, fraud. <laughs> the man's not a dentist. The man's a mechanic, yeah? <laughs> and he's about to pull it out. When he pulls it out, does it hurt anymore? Does it hurt anymore? Does, does everybody get that? It starts to, what? No, you don't get it? When you go ahead and you feel like this is the right thing, you prepare yourself mentally. You're in the game, right? We could... Mental is a lot more, right? Mind over matter is a real thing. Mind over matter is a real thing, right? People, I was just reading this past Pesach about David Blaine. Anyone knows who David Blaine is? A magician or an escape artist, uh, whatever. I don't know what you want to call him, but, you know, a, a witchcraft worker. Anyway, so, so the, I, he was trying to beat the record for holding his breath for the longest. At the time, <clears throat> the record was 11 minutes. 
holding one's breath for 11 minutes. Now you say, how could someone, how do you know? Maybe the guy's like sneaking in some breath, you know? Like as he goes, the answer is underwater, right? The guy's underwater. Uh, so he ended up not beating it, but then he beat it, and he, and he went up to 17 minutes holding his breath. 17 minutes. You know, medically speaking, after 14 minutes, it's considered clinical death. A person without oxygen for four to seven minutes is brain dead. A person after 14 minutes is clinical, it's clinically dead. But he went ahead and he held his breath for 17 minutes. You know what the record is? 23 minutes. There's a, a, a diver, a diver who beat the record. He, he to, now he did uh, use, he had a little, a little help. What was the help just to throw in? Not that this really helps, but he, we know that when we breathe right now, when we breathe, how much oxygen are we actually breathing in the air? Does anyone know what percentage of the air we breathe in is oxygen? 24%? What? 20. 20 to 21%, right? 20, 21% of what we breathe right now is oxygen. There's a lot of other gases going on in the, in the, in the room. So what he did before he did the, the attempt is he, he, he took pure oxygen, right? We called it on the streets, O. Oh. Anyway, so he, uh, he, he, uh, he breathed in 100% oxygen, I think, for 30 minutes or something before he did it. So if you, anyone thinks that's cheating, I want to see you do that and then go under for 23 minutes, right? But the idea is mind over matter. People can go ahead and lower their heart rates. And, and, and stop the amount of blood flow that goes, different things we could do with our mind. If you are prepared mentally for something, so then when the thing occurs, even though there is pain involved, it's less painful. It's actually, like you're, not, you're able to handle a lot more. But if it turns out that this is senseless pain, it's for nothing, then that messes with your head a little bit more. Does this disturb you? Very much. Yeah, the, it's yeah. Guys, quiet down. <laughs> you know, there was a court case in, uh, in Malo Dafna, I don't know how many years ago, 15, 20 years ago or something, that they said, like, they do this at 4 o'clock in the morning, right? So there was a court case against them, and they won. We, we won, they lost. So they, they lowered it for a day, and uh, then they went back. So there are other people in the neighborhood, what they did is they put speakers at 3 o'clock in the morning, and they started blasting Mordechai ben David, you know, like uh, some Jewish music, you know, as they wake up. <laughs> it's, anyway, so, um, so maybe, you know, we could do that. So in any event, back to our program. When Sarah went ahead and oppressed Hagar, according to the explanation I just explained, did, he, did she actually oppress her? The answer is, Hagar was a maidservant. Now, we don't think about it because nowadays we're used to having our Frigidaire and our whatever, you know, products we have. You know, you do, come on it. You do, you do some laundry, uh, whatever. You throw it in, in, in the laundry machine, right? Then or whatever. Laundry was a whole day event, right? You had to go down and you had to, you know, you had to, you know, scrub it on, on my abs, washboard abs, right? And uh, I, know, I know you are thinking it. And uh, I know. And, and it was tough work. It was tough work a whole day. And, and to prepare food, it wasn't like, like I'm going to the Macola, right? It's like you had to grind wheat on my abs also. And you had to go ahead and you had to, you know, you had to make bread. What? It's pretty difficult to go shopping here. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> well, they want to feel like biblical times, right? So anyway, so, so we're talking about, it was, it was rough being a maidservant. It's tough work. But if you have the privilege of being the maidservant of Sarah Imenu, that's huge. You know, I could be, you mean I could do something for, and you just think about it. If, you, if anyone here that you admire, that you look up to, whether it's, you know, a rabbi or a rebbitzin, or even if it's just a, a rock star or a, uh, an actor, an actress, somebody you look up to, and they ask you to be their personal assistant. You'd feel honored, and you get a good paycheck, but you also feel honored. You feel honored to be, wow, this is a person which I love. And they have you doing, like, dog work, but people do it. Why? Because I get to work with Justin! <laughs> Justin! <laughs> right? So they go ahead, and therefore they'll, they'll go and they'll do it. It's an honor. What happens if you turn out that Justin is really a drug addict who likes to speed cars and whatever, and you realize that that is the case? Right? So then it turns out they don't care. But, but let's say your doctor turns out to be, all of a sudden, so what happens if I take El Gvir Tabea now? She looked at Sarah. It's not so special anymore. Look at that. You didn't get pregnant. I got pregnant, bam, right away. You're not so great after all. Now, what happens? And Sarah oppresses her. Did Sarah actually oppress her? Sarah never started, never changed anything. The work was exactly the same as it was the day before. But now, in her eyes, Sarah was a fraud. She wasn't so great. Now it becomes difficult. Does anyone get this idea? Does this make sense? When we go ahead and we lose trust in something, we think something isn't so great, 
So then all of a sudden, it starts to be painful. Do we trust God? Do we trust God? Do we trust God? Not like, um, yeah, yeah, I know there's a God. Do we trust God? Okay, so if one doesn't trust God, so then everything that goes in life, anything that goes wrong in life or the way we perceive is wrong is going to be a lot more painful than it needs to be. And here's the funny thing. This is why we say, and I say funny accidentally, but actually it's funny. We have in Shira Malas, we say in, in Tehillim, Oz Yamale Sechok Pinu. In, in the time, when we get upstairs after we die, in, in times of, um, when, when, you know, when everything becomes clear to us, we're going to Oz Yamale Sechok. At that time, our mouths are going to be filled with laughter. We're going to burst out laughing. And, and I heard from Rabbi Akiva Tantz, Interesting. What's the idea of Azimale Skopino? Why is it that, that when I said on my washboard abs, why did you laugh? Right? The reason you laughed is because I have a keg. I don't have, you know, like a six pack. Okay, I got it. But another reason is because it was totally unexpected. What causes somebody to laugh? What causes someone to laugh is when, when life is going this way, you think it's going to go this way, and then it just takes an abrupt turn the other way. Right? At any time a comedian is, when is somebody really funny? When they say something which is totally like, what? That was not expected, yeah? So what does it mean, when we go and when we see clearly, right? When the rain is gone and, and we can see clearly, so, and there's no obstacles in your way, so then at that moment, we're going to see real truth and everything we thought was a certain way turns out to be exactly the opposite way. Even if it's not a comedy, even if it's like a thriller, there was an amazing movie <clears throat> that I saw before I became Right Ring. And the movie's called The Game. Anybody saw the movie? Michael Douglas, I think it is. The Game? Is anyone going to see it? The, uh, this movie, I think, was, uh, I think it was 1989 or 1990. So if you haven't seen it yet, you're probably not going to. And if you're going to, spoiler alert. I'm about to ruin it for you. This was an awesome movie. <laughs> now you ought to see it. Yeah, so... I won't tell you what it is if you want to see it, but I will tell you the following. You shouldn't be watching movies, though. It's not good for you. But I, but I will tell you, learn Torah, right? But I will tell you the following idea. That was a serious comment that you said, but it really shouldn't be. But okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you what it is, but there is a twist in that movie. And in my mind, of all the movies I saw, and how many movies I see, I probably saw three or four, because I'm Haredi. <laughs> but uh, out of the three to four million movies that I saw, this is, one, this is probably the number one twist I've ever seen. You should watch Frozen. It has a twist. Like Frozen? There's a twist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just let it go, please. In any event, there is a twist of all twists that when the twist happens, even though it's not like a comedy, you, just, you can't help but go, huh. You know, like you're like, huh. That was unexpected, but there's still a, huh. And if it's a comedy, if it's something funny, it's like, right. When we die, we're going to see how everything we thought was bad was totally the opposite of what you thought. Not only was it not bad, everything you thought was bad was actually the very thing which was the, which was the, the catalyst and the enzyme of what all good came from. Sometimes we see that in our life. Sometimes we see in our lifetime something which we thought was bad and we say, oh, thank God I didn't get that job. Thank God she broke up with me twice. Thank God, like whatever, thank God, because it turns out the person was a psycho or the job was crazy or whatever, or I ended up doing something so much better because of it, yeah? How many times we think it's bad, but it really ends up being good. So we see, I have a story to tell you, but I don't know if it's worth the time. I'll tell it to you. Okay, and if you don't like it, you don't like it, but it's so good recently. There was a guy, the guy who ran, you know, ran the shul, got involved in running the shul. And the new rabbi came in and said, okay, I want to sit with you and go through the donors of the shul. Like, find out who are the donors, who are the people that give the money so that we can end up, uh, like, you know, uh, so I can work with them more. So he's like, uh, please give me a list. He's like, I don't have a list. He's like, what do you mean? He goes, it's all up here. It's like, I, I just know it all. He's like, that's not going to work. You, gotta have to write, you have to write it out for me. I want it on my desk tomorrow. He said, I can't do it. Said, what do you mean you can't do it? He's like, I, uh, I don't know how to read or write. It's like, what, you don't know how to read or write? So how do you know people's names and the different aliyahs you give them, whatever? He goes, it's all here, I remember the names. He's like, we can't work like this. I, I'm sorry, I, I can't have someone who can't read or write be the guy by the one who's running the shul. He's like, so what do you want to do? He's like, I have to fire you. He's like, I'll give you a good severance. 
you know, whatever it is, but like we have to find someone else. He's like, oh, okay. So they fire him and they give him a nice amount of money. But he's thinking like, okay, like this is the bad thing, or whatever it is, you know. He goes to his personal rabbi and he's like, what do I do with this money? He's like, listen, you, you know, there's no inns in between different towns that are Jewish inns. And like people have to stop by a non-Jewish inn, open an inn, like a little motel, little thing, and be, you know, people can re recoup, and recoup and whatever. He says, okay, he opens it up and it becomes the hottest thing in towns, right? Because uh, no one has this thing but Jews, but, but non-Jews. So he starts to make a lot of money. And uh, one day a banker comes in and he's like, you know, uh, I hear your fortune has gone up. Yeah, he said, yeah. He's like, well, I got an idea for you. Like, where do you keep your money? He's like, well, right here in this safe. This is not a foreshadow where he's going to steal it, right? Although I thought it when I heard the story. He goes and he says, so right here. He's like, oh, he's like, well, you know, I'm a banker. Why don't you give me the money and I'll double it within three or four years. He's like, great idea. He's like, okay, so all you have to do is read this paper, sign on the bottom, and we're good to go. Can't do it. Then you can't do it. You know, you're going to make a lot of money. He's like, I don't know how to read or write. He's like, what? You don't know how to read or write? He's like, no. He's like, you have this money, you don't know how to read or write? He's such a fool. So he says back, if I was a fool, I would know how to read or write, and I would still be a gabai. Right? But now I don't, so thank God. Now I made all this money. So that's why I debated, is it worth it? But the idea <laughs> is that is that we find that you think it's bad you get fired from your job, you became very wealthy from it. Now, this is assuming wealth is good, but let, let's take a look and look at it in that light. At least most people do until they realize it's not, but, but for now, let's say it is. But we find that we think that it's really bad, it's really not bad. That's all you might have We're going to die, we're going to get upstairs, we're going to burst out laughing. And be like, oh my gosh, I thought this was all bad, it's really not, it's really all good. And then come up with the questions, oh yeah, well, what about the Holocaust, right? Yom HaShoah, what about the Holocaust? How is that really good? And what about when a person, God forbid, gets raped? What about when a person gets cancer when they're a baby during the Holocaust in a tsunami? What about then? People like to throw in all the emotional aspects or whatever, like, what am I going to answer you? You're asking me an emotional question, there's no answers to your questions, right? I have no clue. What I do know is that God runs the world. What I do know is that God is all good, and God is all powerful, and God is all knowing, and God is the most perfect thing. That, there's nothing perfect but God. And I know that everything he does is good. I'll explain it. I can't explain it to you. Well, how do you even know? Oh, how do I even know? So then we have to take a step back and know how I know. Right, we know from the Torah. How do you know the Torah is true? Okay, all this is required to go through. If something really bad happened, like, God forbid, like, you want to lose trust, like, if something really horrible happened. You're asking me what would I do personally? I would hope not. I don't know. I would hope not. You're asking a very good question. So let's be real for a second, Friedman, right? Let's be real. I'm Friedman. Let, let's be real here. Yeah, you understand? I know my whole name. All right, let's be real. But uh, you you telling me you're going to be okay with some of the... Blah, blah, blah. Let's see. The way the Chazanish says it, I'm going to quote Rabbi Tatz when he writes out this whole thing. He, he, he writes the Chazanish in English. says, to one who sees the light of truth, there is no sadness in this world. Right? To one who really is connected and understands, who really understands... Now, let's be real, we're human beings. So what's going to be Friedman if you go through something? I hope I don't have to be tested. I hope I never get tested with this. I hope if I ever, God forbid, if I ever do get tested, that I have the proper tools to be able to overcome the test. I hope never to be tested. But I hope if I am, I have the proper tools. So what will, I, what will I react? How will I react? You know what? I don't know. I don't know. I've had tests in my life. I've failed a lot of them. I've had tests in my life that I would like to think that I passed some of them. So what I do in order to get uh, to a level where they'll pass it is one needs to fortify the trust. One needs to fortify the trust. One needs to open their eyes and recognize all the positive things that are happening in their life. One has to take a look and see, okay, we go and we notice the negative things. Someone got murdered, someone got killed, someone got sick, someone whatever. Let me tell you an interesting story. I heard a fascinating story. I, I believe this was written, I think I saw this in an article by, by Ginsberg from New York, Aries of Ginsberg, who wrote about pain. I think he lost a grandchild, Rechman al-Lutzlan, and, and he wrote about the following idea. There was a woman, and this woman uh, got sick. She got cancer. And uh, it was pretty bad, and she was dying. And she didn't tell her children. She didn't want anyone to know. Okay, whether you should, shouldn't do it, this is what she did. As she was getting to a point where it was Towards the end, she had no choice but to tell them. So she came to her, one of her children and said, son, I just want you to know, I, I have cancer. I, that said, this woman said that she has cancer and she's dying. And, um, and she said, listen, I, you know, I want to let you know before and you should, you should brace for impact. So she goes, I don't get it, mom. 
Why you? You're such a good woman. Like out of all people, I understand why would God do such a thing to you? Why? Why? I don't get it. Why? And she said, let me, let me tell you something. When I was a little girl, I always dreamed of getting married and having a, you know, a princess wedding and uh, you know, meeting the man of my dreams. <clears throat> and I did. I, I met your father. And it was amazing. And we had a beautiful wedding. And it was such a beautiful, was, the experience was exactly like I wanted it to be in the, the pictures. And you've seen them on the wall, they're majestic. And I always wanted to have a family. <clears throat> and I had a family. And I had you. And I had your brother. Your sister was a little challenging. But I had your, no, 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 but I had, I had your kids. And, and it was great. And, and everything was wonderful. And, and, I, and I always wanted to have like, Parnassah, I should have a livelihood. And I did, I had a livelihood. And, and I had a home. And, and I had everything. <clears throat> And I had so many good things happen to me in my life. <clears throat> I never turned to God and asked why when all the good things happened to me. I'm not going to start asking why when the bad things happen. Does anybody get that? We have this mentality that when good things happen to us, like, of course it happens to us. <laughs> like, why shouldn't the good things be happening to us? But when the bad things, like, I don't even understand. <clears throat> why do I deserve this bad thing? I think if we really thought about it, we would understand a lot of why the bad things happen to us and not so much why the good things happen to us. <laughs> right? As I once heard a rabbi say, why do bad things happen to good people? I don't know other people, I just know me. Because I'm bad. And therefore, bad things happen. How many of us can say, no, 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 no. I am 100% good. And I deserve only good to be bestowed upon me. Right? I think we could find more bad than good, unfortunately. And I think that's what we end up focusing on. Is a glass half full or is a glass... Empty. This generation is, is no longer half empty. It's empty. Yeah, instead, there was a time where like it's half full or half empty. Now it's like if it ain't full, it's empty. Yeah, that's the way that we look at it. Right? We're so, we're so spoiled. What did you want to say? Perfectionism. I'm always like in the same. Okay, so this idea we have this mentality of perfectionism. We don't have the best, and we, then we're like the elite, the narcissistic, right? The concept of like we have everything good. So you ask me. What? What if I have the terrible thing happen? I'm, I'm going to be able to keep the trust. The answer is, I don't know, and I hope yes, but I do know that the way to build on one's trust is to start focusing and recognizing all the positive happenings in our life. And start to look at the fact that, thank God, thank God, I was speaking recently somewhere, and I said the following, and, and then I caught myself, and I, and I said, thank God we can walk. And as I'm saying, I'm looking in front of me, there's a man in a wheelchair. And I was thinking, oh yeah, I feel terrible I just said that. But then I said, and if you can't walk, you could see. And then I saw there's a blind guy. I was like, but if you can't see, you could hear. And then this deaf guy was very offended, but he didn't hear me anyway. And the answer is no. But even if we can't hear, or we can't see, or we can't whatever, there's something that we have, <clears throat> there's something we have. There's, a, there's a, a booklet out there. I don't know if they still have it out there. Sometimes there's little pamphlets out there <clears throat> that about... Uh, what's the secret to happiness, I think it is, if you've ever seen it before. A lot of times, how does a person stop a person from low who, God forbid, a person wanting to take their own life? A person who's going to take their own life, how do you, how do you talk someone out of that? A person who doesn't see any reason to live. I can't, thank God, I've never been in a situation where I had to deal with that. But I, but I could tell you that what it spoke about there, when you, when you read about these things, what is, what's the goal? To find something that's worth living find something that's worth living. In other words, everyone has something that's worth it. Do we focus on that positive or are we focusing so much on the negative? So now we say, how does one react to bad things when they happen? Unless you have fortified yourself with positive, it's going to be very hard to deal with negative. Unless we fortified ourselves with positive and understanding and trust, unless we built up that trust and recognized the trust, people, do we realize, do we trust God? Every breath that we take is right now being facilitated by God allowing us to do that. Every time you open your eyes and you look at something, to quote Rabbi Victor Miller, life, Rabbi Victor Miller, if anyone didn't know who he was, 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 uh, was quite a, a wise man, big rabbi in New York, and a person you would look at, you wouldn't expect him to speak like this, but, you know, beard and the whole thing. And life is fun. Life is very fun. It's fun to see. Colors are fun. Food is fun. Breathing is fun. 
Do we look at life as fun? Are we recognizing how fun it is? When you get up and you turn around and you can do this, you know, cracking your knuckles, it's fun. <laughs> Might not be good for you, but it's fun. <laughs> All these things are fun. Do we look at life and realize how fun it is? And we build up our trust and say, look what God did for me. Look what God did for me and does for me. In spite of the fact that I go against him time and time again, <laughs> he still continues to do for me. That's fun. That's awesome. Hey, I trust this God. I trust this doctor. I trust this physical therapist. I trust this one of the imahos. I trust these things. And then when the bad thing, God forbid, happens, we have to draw upon that wellspring. We have to draw upon that bank, which is full of trust, and say, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I trust that you know what you're talking about. Which is why when a terrible thing happens in the world, we don't say, Baruch HaTov Emetiv, blessed is the good one, the one who bestows good upon. But we say, Baruch Dayan Emes, blessed is the truthful judge. Because I don't see it as good now, but I know you're the truthful judge. I know you're the honest one. I know you know what you're talking about. So therefore, people, at the end of the day, what do we got? So we put everything in summation, start from the beginning, understand the concept of what happened, these terrible tragedies, was just a critical person who just passed away, this little young man, 25 years old, and they're getting killed, another woman's in critical condition right now. Reg is the fact that what's going on in the of really what's happening over the earth, the time of the tragedy, because of the world, of the real effect that God is involved in every aspect of the world, we live in the center of the world, every aspect of the world, realize really everything is really good. So, how does a person get to the concept of realizing everything's aspect of this world, really, everything is really good? A person has to go and really build the level of trust. Oh, I'm sorry, man, take a look what happened over there. And so, the concept of what happens is good. If I take a look at the man up, she got pregnant right away. Things are so great after all. I was looking at her negative, and then she oppressed her, oppressed her. This is the most. Well, who is that lady? And it's just a woman. Donkey. How do we look at ourselves? We look at people like that great, we look at people a little bit lower. And so, to be a maidservant, you have to wash things. You know what I'm saying? Boing. Right, so anyway, but I, you know, there was maybe a time when it was like that, not now. It's under there somewhere. <laughs> Understand the kind of what happened, but it's hard work being a maidservant. And then the person going to realize the fact that it's a little bit hard and difficult to be, and we've never really changed the first place. Your perception changed. Yeah, the doctor's really good. Fraud! The guy's a mechanic. Right, all of a sudden, like, rip that thing out. I think there's a problem with your discombobulator. What? What's the discombobulator? Ah! Right, it's a little bit more. Recognize the fact that what? Akash Bauchu said, doctor. Akash Bauchu is, is, our, is, our, is our lawyer. Akash Bauchu is, uh, is our physical therapist. Akash Bauchu, God is running the world. God knows everything that's going on. He realizes that everything that's going on. And I want to share with you an amazing thing. The atomic number, we know that they say that, that salt, that salt um, is similar. HaKadosh Baruch Hu heals people's pain with salt. So they say like put salt on a wound. It's like the worst thing you do. But, but pain is like salt. HaKadosh Baruch Hu giving a, a person pain is like, is like salting food. If you put too much salt, you destroy it. If you put too little salt, it doesn't help. If you put just the right amount of salt, salt is the only spice. I don't know if this is true, I'm just, but it sounds better when you say the only one, you know? <laughs> but I think it is. The only spice that doesn't mask taste and doesn't change taste, but it brings out the taste and enhances the taste. God gives people pain in life to the exact increment that is needed to bring out the best in a person, whether as an atonement or to bring out a person's true abilities and kohos. What's so amazing? And abilities and kohos. What's a koach? Strength, the power. You want to bring out someone's real strength. Salt is sodium chloride. Chloride. Don't worry about it. That's for the yeah. teeth. We talked about teeth, so fluoride is for your teeth. Sodium chloride, what's the, what, what is it called? Give me, give me the NaCl. NACL. Sodium chloride, what is the atomic number for sodium? Yeah, you made that up. What's the atomic number? Uh, one of them is 17, and the other one is 11. You add 17 and 11 together, what do you get? Salt. What's 17 and 11? 28. What's 28? Numerical value, koach. Salt brings out the ultimate koach in a thing, in a person, in an individual. And a pain that somebody goes through, we have to recognize that any pain we're having, any pain we experience, whether it's on our physical body or it's a mental pain of an extension and it should be a mental pain of a fellow Jew that died today, person goes and understands, recognize the fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is salting and he's giving the ultimate that a person needs in order to grow from this.
And if we then at that moment turn away from it and we say, ah, forget this, that's like taking a delicious steak and throwing it out. Are you nuts? If you don't like steak, so then you're nuts. But if you don't like to eat a delicious steak, throwing it out, are you out of your mind? What are you doing? Imagine someone taking a beautiful sirloin mm, on the bone. Mm. We're talking about medium well, not bloody, but a little pink, a little pink. And you throw that out. You gotta be out of your mind. Akadosh Baruch Hu is cooking the perfect steak. And if you're vegetarian, we have to help you. We have to help you quick. Any questions, comments, stories, jokes, attacks? Okay, people, it's been a pleasure to see you when I see you. I don't know what, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. <laughs>